Welcome to the fourth episode in our spiritual formation series, um, where we're talking about spiritual practices that we can use in our journey to become more like Jesus. One of my husband Sam's, ooh, that, I sound kind of fancy. Can you guys like make me sound less robotic? <laughs> um, one of my husband Sam's favorite co-workers retired last year. So this past December, we met up with him because he's such a lovely guy, we just can't get enough, to ask how retirement's going. And we were fascinated to hear he and his wife had just been on a walking tour of Hadrian's Wall. Um, those are the kind of retirement dreams Sam and I have. Uh, but with my health limitations, it seems impossible for us. And when we said as much, he said, Oh no, anyone can do it. You just have to plan and get the right gear. Actually, he said, it's my favorite part, the planning and picking the best gear. So, this morning, let's think of your spiritual journey, uh, spiritual life as a long journey you're on. And these practices, like gratitude and worship, are the things you want in your backpack. The high-end gear that are gonna protect you from getting blisters while climbing a mountain or keep you warm and dry during a storm. And today, the tool or spiritual practice I'm gonna talk about is contemplation and meditation. The definition of meditation is to think deeply or focus one's mind for a period of time in silence or with the aid of chanting for religious or spiritual purposes or as a method of relaxation. Think deeply or carefully about Plan mentally. Consider. Contemplation is very similar. The action of looking thoughtfully at something for a long time. Deep, reflective thought. The state of being thought about or planned. Now, before we talk about how we, as Jesus followers, can use meditation as a powerful tool in our spiritual journey, let's talk about how our culture looks at meditation and why it would be a problem for us to do it that way. Because our culture treats meditation like its own end. Some people's whole spiritual practice is meditation. The emptying out of self for peace and relaxation. And in our culture of constantly ingesting information and entertainment, more, newer, brighter, faster, louder, YOLO, FOMO, well, of course it makes sense. They just need a little peace and quiet inside. But for us to use meditation that way would be like deliberately packing a big, empty lunchbox and putting in our backpack for our long journey. Well, it's silly, right? For us, meditation is not its own end. It is a path to a greater end, a supplementary tool to our core spirituality. We aren't emptying ourselves out, but instead using meditation to fill ourselves with God with his words, with his presence, with his promises. The lunch kit we want to pack is a full one. But to do that, we must unlearn our cultural ideas of meditation. We've all sit a, seen a movie with someone sitting cross-legged with their hands like this, maybe, and possibly even levitating, right? Uh, remember, the definition of meditation mentioned none of that. It says to think deeply or carefully about. So I want to offer you a new way this morning, just one of many available to us, to think about meditation. And it's a video by The Bible Project. You can see. So The Bible is a collection of books written in different literary styles, like narrative, poetry, and prose. And most of us are familiar with these kinds of literature. Yeah, we all know a narrative when we see one, like The Hunger Games or The Great Gatsby. And most people can recognize poetry, whether it's Walt Whitman or the songs of Bob Dylan. And every day we're surrounded by prose and news articles or essays. Now all of these examples are modern American literature in that they came from this time period and this region of the world. But there's also medieval English literature literature from another place in time, or ancient Greek writings from this place in time. So each time period and culture produces its own unique kind of literature. And in order to read the Bible well, we need to keep in mind that it comes from this part of the world and was produced in this basic period of time. So what's unique about ancient Jewish literature? Well, a key feature is that it lacks a lot of the details that modern readers have come to expect in stories and poems. And this makes it seem really simple. But actually, it's very sophisticated literature. Every detail that is given matters. 
And that's great, but the lack of detail means that stories are often loaded with ambiguities. I mean, take one of the first stories, Adam and Eve in the Garden. Where did this talking snake come from? And why did God allow him there? Why didn't Adam and Eve die on the spot like God said they would? And who's this offspring of the woman who will destroy the snake but is bitten by it? Yeah, so many puzzles in this story. And some of these are questions that we have and that are not important to what the author is focusing on. But some of these ambiguities are in Intentional. Intentional? Won't that lead to bad interpretations, people filling in the gaps with their own answers? Well, that's a risk the biblical authors took in writing this way. We all tend to impose our own cultural assumptions onto the Bible, but they apparently thought the risk was worth it. These oddities are really invitations into an adventure of reading and discovery. What do you mean? Well, for example, the strange promise about the offspring of the woman crushing and being bitten by the snake. That word offspring is a clue to pay attention to genealogies, which, lo and behold, run all through the biblical narrative. They trace the lineage from Eve all the way to King David and his offspring. And in the New Testament, Jesus is connected to the offspring of this royal line. Now, when you read the prophets, Isaiah connected this king to the suffering servant who would die on behalf of his people. And then in the book of Revelation, there's this symbolic vision. And can you guess? It's about a woman and her offspring. It's Jesus and his followers who conquer the dragon by giving up their lives. Yeah, so each part of the story there is loaded with ambiguities, but altogether it makes sense. And this is the literary genius of the Bible. It forces you to keep reading and then interpret each part in light of the others. This is feeling complicated. I don't know if I can do all that. Well, you're actually not expected to notice all of this by yourself or all at once. This dense way of writing forces you to slow down and then read carefully, embarking on this interactive discovery process through the whole biblical narrative over a lifetime of reading and rereading. Ah, okay, meditation literature. Yeah, in Psalm 1, we read about the ideal Bible reader. It's someone who meditates on the scriptures day and night. In Hebrew, the word meditate means literally to mutter or speak quietly. The idea is that every day for the rest of your life, you slowly, quietly read the Bible out loud to yourself and then go talk about it with your friends, pondering the puzzles, making connections, and discovering what it all means. And as you let the Bible interpret itself, something remarkable happens. The Bible starts to read you. Starts to read you. The thought struck me as I watched that video, not the first time, but maybe like the third time, that when he's mumbling, murmuring the scriptures, it looks like he's chewing, which is actually my core idea today because it is the perfect metaphor for meditation. Taking something God has given you and chewing on it, swallowing it down until it actually becomes part of you, just like eating and digesting a meal. Physical food, when digested, fuels your body, uh, gives energy to your muscles, provides crucial nutrients for cel cellular function. Meditation on the things of God is ingesting spiritual food to fuel your faith, to strengthen you, to provide crucial spiritual defense. <laughs> Forgive me in advance, guys, for this next continuation of the metaphor. I was horrified at my own self even as it came to me because it's a little coarse, but I knew I was still going to use it because this metaphor keeps on giving. Um, what happens when you try to eat your food too quickly? It gets stuck in your throat and it can take you out, right? Or uh, it gets wasted or... You swallow it down whole, and if you've hurried through eating corn on the cob, or perhaps you have ever had a toddler or a puppy, you'll get where I'm going without making me have to say it. If you don't take your time and break down what you're trying to eat to an absorbable level, it can't become part of you, right? It doesn't get digested and will pass right through you, and you'll get nothing out of it. That's the same spiritually as it is physically. I was just talking about our culture and how we're constantly consuming more and more information at a rate that has never been experienced before in human history. And at the pace we consume, guys, we can't digest anything. You know what I do when I flip the last page on a teaching book that I have really loved? I say, I got to read that again because I've already forgotten most of it. 
right? Because when I'm always hurrying to finish my current podcast, my current book, my current prayer, my current project, and I'm rushing to move on to the next thing, what's just passing through me? Digestion takes time. After watching John Mark Comer's message, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, the first Sunday of the year here, I knew I wanted to hear more of what he had to say. So I requested his book from the library. And guys, I know Martin has said it. I'm going to say it too. This book blew my mind, okay? Um, I don't think I've ever said this before except in, about anything except the Bible. But honestly, for people in my stage of life, at least... For sure, my age, but maybe everyone, it's a must read. <laughs> you remember when Vern preached 12 rules for life in January? And rule number 11 was one rule to rule them all. Trust was the rule that made all the other rules possible. Trust makes faithfulness possible. Trust makes receiving correction possible. Right? As I read Comer's book, the thought has come to me repeatedly that we can't adopt any spiritual practices at all if we're in a hurry. The ruthless elimination of hurry is the spiritual practice to rule them all. It's time to slow down. And meditation and contemplation are choice ways to do that. Um, Sam and I, don't judge us, have just started watching The Chosen. I know we're like three or four years behind everyone else. And guys, I love it so much. We sit there in our basement, and most of the time where we're watching it, I'm just le leaking tears. I love how they portray Jesus. And the disciples, so petty, I relate. And the miracles, and the episode where John gets his idea, his inspiration to start thinking of his account of the gospel really inspired me. So I've just been camped out in John for like two months slowly, slowly, slowly making my way through. And chapter six arrested me. Um, I have read it before over the years many times, right? But this time it was new. Um, and I think God literally orchestrated my life to wait to watch The Chosen and then watch it and then get stuck in John six, right? So I could do that while I'm writing this sermon because he has some insight for us this morning, guys. Now at face value, this chapter has nothing to do with meditation, but bear with me, okay? Okay, okay. So I don't have time to read the whole chapter aloud. So it begins with um, Jesus feeding 5,000 men plus uncounted women and children with one boy's lunch of five barley loaves and two fish. It says there's more food left over after everyone's eaten than there was to begin with. They pick up 12 baskets of leftovers. It's an undisputable miracle, right? The people are so excited about this. It says they want to force Jesus to be their king. And Jesus takes off and hides because that is not what he's here for. So make note, little side thing I want you to remember. Jesus saw their need for food without him telling them, right? Right? This was a miracle of kindness. You can go without lunch one day. They would have been fi fine. It's not a dire circumstance. So if we think about this miracle, we can see certain characteristics, characteristics about Jesus. He's kind. He's considerate. He provides abundantly, even when it's not dire. We see Jesus is good, right? Okay. And the crowd responds to this kindness, this goodness, with force. It says they want to force him to be king. So you read between the lines. It's like they see what God's do God does and they say, this is who you're going to be for me, God. You're going to do what I want you to do, God. I'm the one in control here. And this is a little foreshadowing of what happens in the rest of the chapter. So back to the story. The disciples get tired of waiting for Jesus to come back, so they, they take some boats across, or they take a boat across the lake, and then Jesus comes back and finds them gone, so he walks across the lake. Pretty cool. And the next morning, the crowd is looking for Jesus, and they know the disciples left without him, but they can't find him, so they get on some boats, and they cross the lake, and then when they find Jesus across the lake, they say, when did you get here? They know something's happened. Jesus, who walked, it says, three or four miles on water, 
<laughs> like, so cool. He says nothing. He's already wary of their motives. He doesn't tell them what's happened. He sidesteps it. And then they have this really interesting and illuminating conversation. Um, let's pick through it. And I'm going to kind of flesh out some possible motives for the crowd while, we, while we're at it. I hope you won't think it's adding to scripture. I think when we try to figure out what people are saying, we understand it better. Deal? Don't judge me? Okay. All right. So starting, okay, um, we're going to read so much scripture this morning. Uh, John 6, 25 to 58 and 66 to 69, but we're going to go through it slowly. Okay, verse 25, they, the crowd of 5,000, found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. Okay, so this is true. Jesus isn't just saying that. He's God. He can see inside them. He sees the motives of their heart. That's true. They literally saw a miraculous miracle of provision, and all they got out of it was lunch. Okay? If they had understood the miracle, if they look up beyond their immediate concerns, they'd see his kindness, his provision, his deity, but no, lunch. Let's call this phenomenon of completely missing the point of what God's doing uh, going 5,000, okay? We don't want to go 5,000, but if we're honest, we do often. Okay, we, we, Jesus carries on in verse 27. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They've got their priorities so wrong, and Jesus tells them. And then he shows them what, or he tells them what they really need. And they respond in verse 28. We want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Well, I guess they didn't like Jesus' little correction because they ignore it. And then they ask what works they can do. Does that sound familiar at all? I want your power, God. If you won't do what I want, just give me your power and I'll do it. I don't like that, just believe stuff. Verse 29, Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. I don't want your wrongly motivated works, guys, and my power is not going to satisfy you. Believe in me. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? He's already done two pretty fancy miracles, right? Show us your miracles again. What's their motivation here? To me, it sounds like, entertain me. I'm here for the show. Gimme. That didn't fill me. I want more. They continue in verse 31. After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Manna and Moses. Do what you did in the past, God. Give me something easy to eat. Give me something easy to digest, and then, then I'll believe, maybe. Jesus responds, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I'm the true manna. I'm the true meal. Believe I'm what you really need. Are they going to get it this time, guys? Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Give me a guarantee, God. I'd like certainty. Verse 35 to 40. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me, even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me, but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. 
He says, you don't need a guarantee if you believe, but you guys don't believe. I'm going to give you a better guarantee. Uh, He's never going to reject them. He'll be true to God's will, not his own. He promises them resurrection and eternal life. Sounds good, right? Verse 41. Then the people began to murmur in disagreement because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? Verse 43 to 51. But Jesus replied, stop complaining about what I said. For no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day, I will raise them up. As it is written in the scriptures, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father. Only I, who was sent from God, have seen him. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I offer so the world may live, is my flesh. He reiterates the promise with even more clarity. Resurrection, being taught by God himself. Jesus says he is a first-person witness of God which back then is, means it's true, right? G, etern, he promises them eternal life. He promises them a, a promise better than the past. They're asking for manna, and he's promising them something better. Guys, surely this time the crowd is going to stop and listen. It's like you asking someone, hey, I'm hungry, could you buy me lunch? And they say, no, you don't need lunch. I'm going to pay off your mortgage. And then I'm going to make you young and healthy forever. They're going to get it this time, guys, right? Let's see. Verse 53. No, 52. The people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They asked. They missed the point entirely, guys. Jesus always used stories and metaphor in his teaching. And 5,000 people don't show up because they never heard of someone. These people are familiar with Jesus and his teachings and his ministry. Right? Okay? He, He always did this. He's not saying what they want. And they just won't stop and think beyond that. And it costs them. Verse 53 to 58 and verse 66. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate manna, but will live forever. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Interestingly, Jesus takes the metaphor that was offending them even further. And this pushy, pig-headed, stubborn crowd takes off. Because this is what they wanted Jesus for. Their immediate needs. Lunch. Control. Well, we want to perform God's works too. Excitement. Entertainment, what can you do? Predictability, show us another sign. Guarantees and certainty will give us that bread every day. But he says, every time, only want me. I am the only thing that's going to satisfy you ever. 
Instead of giving them what they want, he shows them to the way to what they desperately need, what will actually satisfy their souls, which they ignore. And our gracious, patient God repeats himself over and over again, making it clearer and clearer each time. But they refuse to look beyond their own perspective of who he is and what they want him to do. Their view of God is so small, so immediate, so finite. And then he says something I believe was deliberately offensive. Well, if you're going to be like that, all right, then chew on this. And they fall away. I have come to God more often and regularly than I would like you guys to know, like this crowd. I've wanted easy. I've wanted vending machine Christianity, a miracle dispensing God, thank you very much. This past Christmas, we ended up with a lump sum of $7,000. Sam got a raise that they back paid 18 months, and I qualified for a government benefit because of my health. And so we got, we, as soon as we found out we were going to get $7,000, I was like, oh, okay, we need to fix the car, and then we need this thing for the house. Okay, this is so great. And then that same week when we got the money, we found out Aria needed braces, and they cost, <laughs> you guessed it. And was I grateful? Is, <laughs> no. <laughs> I was like, it's spent before we even got it. Well, thanks for lunch, God. What about lunch tomorrow? What about lunch next week? <laughs> I've wanted a controllable God. I've wanted certainty. <laughs> Control and certainty sounds great, don't it? Yeah. It's so easy to judge the 5,000 until we look at what they're really asking for and we realize that's all the stuff we want to, right? But Jesus wasn't then and isn't now pleased with that kind of faith because it leads nowhere except selfishness and rigidity. Shallow faith, like the rocky and thorny soil in the parable in Matthew 13, right? And it looks to me Reading this passage, like he actually purposely derails that kind of faith. As though it's so dangerous to us to believe this way, that it's better for us to leave and have the chance to come back and believe another day than continue bumbling on in that way. Now, a reminder here. Jesus saw their needs before they even asked, and he provided miraculously. That's why the crowd is following him around here, because they saw what he did, and they were like, whoop, whoop right? It's amazing. So I'm not saying that God wants us to suffer or thinks our needs are unimportant. And Jesus wasn't saying that here. He's already shown otherwise, right? What it is saying is that those things shouldn't be our focus. That if we're chasing God for those things, we're missing the entire point. We're eating lunch and missing the miracle. So what does John 6 have to do with meditation and contemplation? In this chapter, I see a really stark example of what faith without the meditation definition, faith without deep and careful thought looks like. What it looks like when you take what God gives you and you swallow it without chewing. When he does a miracle and you gulp it down and say, what's next? I'm hungry. When his goodness passes through you and is wasted because you didn't take the time to chew and absorb it. And this marks a clear divide between the disciples who are for real and who just wants a full belly. And if you just want a full belly, you aren't going to make it. Because free lunch isn't motivation enough when the going gets tough. When I went through my deconstruction, uh, there was hardly anything in my 30 years of faith that I had broken down and absorbed enough that it was part of me and couldn't be taken. And I very nearly fell away, you guys. The only thing that kept me, the only thing in my bones was the knowledge that God was faithful. That I was sure about. My lack of taking my time with God's miracles in my life over the years, and there were many, 
to really see them and consider what they meant about God and his love for me and his provision in my life to absorb them nearly cost me my faith. My lack of taking time to chew on the many scriptures and prophetic words and visions God had given me through himself and others. My hurrying to the next miracle, the next big need, the next thing allowed a weakness in my character, a shallowness in my faith that opened me up to a faith-killing storm of confusion, fear, and doubt. Because when you go 5,000, You don't take your time to digest what God's done. You can't see who he really is. And you can't see what he's really doing. All you can see is the next big unmet need. And that will strangle your faith dead. Meditation and contemplation are powerful tools in our spiritual backpacks that mature us, refine our faith, and strengthen us so we don't have shallow roots by making sure we absorb and understand what God is saying and doing and who he is. When Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness, Jesus doesn't need to pray, get some protection up. He doesn't need to scour through the Bible for a promise. He's ready. His father's with him. The word is in him, and he kicks butt. Jesus' lunchbox is full. Now back to John 6, starting in 67 through 69. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, Are you also going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. They're saying exactly what he was telling the crowd over and over again. We believe you're the only one who satisfies. Where else would we go? This is the faith that God wants. So in the face of Jesus making a very confusing and offensive claim, cannibalism, metaphor or no, many fall away, but 12 stay. Why? We need to know. What makes the 12 greater than the 5,000? We need to know because hard times will come. There are going to be days when you're so confused by what God has allowed or has not done in your life when your very faith is heavy, when God does something and you're going to choke on it, it's going to be tempting to fall away just like the 5,000 because they didn't understand, right? The 12, those who stayed, were those who had lived with Jesus. They had talked with Jesus. They'd seen Jesus interact when he had low blood sugar and was operating on four hours of sleep. They had traveled with him. They had seen him deal with conflict. They had been with him for months and years, interacted with him daily. These are the people who stay. Because they've spent so much time with him, they know Jesus, and they can trust him even when they don't understand. Tragically, we can't travel through ancient Egypt ancient Israel for three years with Jesus in the flesh, like the disciples did. But we do have the Bible, the Holy Spirit, and each other. So if we want to know Jesus like they did, we can read, we can meditate on these scriptures daily. If you eat lots of bread, it becomes part of you. If you read lots of scriptures, They'll become part of you. If if we want to know Jesus, we can pay attention to the moving and the speaking of the Holy Spirit and contemplate what he says means. What's he doing? What does this say about who he is and his love for me? If we want to become like Jesus, we can invest in our relationships here to grow the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives, to sharpen each other's iron, to soften our rough edges until 
We become like him and he becomes part of us, trans- transforms our innermost self, strengthens us, forms us into what God intends us to be. Philippians 4, verses 8 through 9, is a great scripture that demystifies meditation, puts it in a godly context, and gives simple instruction on how to do it. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. King Solomon, the greatest king that ever lived, wrote something similar to his son. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, for they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. And John Mark Comer says this, What you give your attention to is the person you become. Put another way, the mind is the portal to the soul. What you fill your mind with will shape the trajectory of your character. In the end, Your life is no more than the sum of what you gave your attention to. Now, I'm not going to give you a how to meditate outline. I'm not going to list all the Bible scriptures on meditation, and there are many. Because to me, that's something you'll choose to do if you value it, if you want to, right? You'll find the verses that speak to you and the methods that inspire and work for you. What my whole intention today has been is to show you how powerful meditation and contemplation are to followers of Jesus. The rest is up to you. I got got zero power to make you change. That's, That's between you and Jesus. So to close, I want to give you a really simple assignment for the week ahead. I want you to get a piece of paper, maybe a cute post-it note. Put it somewhere where you'll see it every day, multiple times a day. Bedside table, bathroom mirror, fridge, whatever. And every time God does something, even the littlest thing this week, write it down. If he speaks to you, if he uses you in someone else's life, if you feel his moving, if he sends you a dream, write it all down. And sometime towards the end of the week, take even 10 minutes if you're busy and meditate on it. What's God doing? What's he saying? Is there a theme here? What does this mean? See if you can see the miracle and not ignore lunch, but just eat lunch. Don't make that the focus. And we'll see if we grow some fruit in our lives this week.